Greetings, Wilkinson here. Today, my guest is Stan Zimmerman. Why don't you tell him you are? First of all, say hi, Stan. Say hi to my people. Hi, Stan. <laughs> oh, you're gonna be you're gonna be a headache. Trouble, yeah. And you're gonna. Be trouble. Well, no, there's a famous line. Hi, it's me, Stan, <laughs> which is um, Herb Edelman's entrance on most Golden Girl episodes. All right, fine. All right, drop one the credit. Gold. There you go. The rolls. <laughs> okay, you didn't say hi to my people, but they hi, people. They, they won't feel bad. That's fine. So, uh, how do we meet, Stan? How do you and I meet? Yeah, how do we tell? You can tell that story. Well, originally, I was fascinated by your photography. And <laughs> what? <laughs> I just got and a of babies. And especially your, um, what should we call it? The pictorial essays of men during COVID at their at front doors. Okay. I found that fascinating. <laughs> so, let's talk about you then. Oh, it's not about it's not about you. No, no, no. Okay, okay. No, I'm not. Well, that was originally. And then we've been working on what uh, the new century. Paul Rudnick's fantastic play at the Ben Theater at the Cultural Center here in Palm Springs, February eighth to the eighteenth. Only eight shows, so they better is that, get is that an advertisement. That's fine. <laughs> so anyway, we've been working together on that. Yes, and you have been utterly fantastic and Thank just. For the get-go, uh, just so on top of things, and that's been really great to be able to work with somebody like that that is excited about doing theater, and I see such a growing theater community in Palm Springs, and I hope I can be a part of that. Yeah, so you are our first guest director uh -oh. wow. at the event. I better be on my best behavior. Yeah. So far, have I been? Yeah. Uh, and there have been a couple. I of mean, everybody's got to hate you a little bit when you get to the stage, right? No, <laughs> they love me. All right. All right. So let's, uh, you're gay. Oh, we're just jumping right. We're going to jump right out okay, that. Okay. Well, you know, most of my listeners are gay. So we want to hear all okay. the gay stories. It's so not like I've been in the, the closet. Uh, well, I was in the, in the early part of my career, which people find that kind of shocking when I tell them that on Golden Girls, we were told by our representatives to stay in the closet and, and to bring a woman as what they called a beard um, <laughs> to any event that we went to. Because wow. they look at Golden Girls and see it as, you know, an extremely progressive show, which it was at the time. Right. But on staff, uh, it was still an all boys club, even though there were for a sitcom, there were a, a more women actually there was uh susan harris who created it although she was not in the writer's room because she was experiencing epstein Barr syndrome mm -hmm. um at the time but there was um two women and people think that you know the show must have been all gay people but it really was just me and my writing partner jim berg uh mark cherry and jamie wooten came much later in the show but we were there the first season adding our, our little quiet gay agenda um <laughs> but we kept it quiet, and it was only Estelle Getty that uh, had her gaydar up, I think, from years of working on oh, really? New York theater, and uh, especially with Torch Song Trilogy. You know, she became famous for playing Harvey Firestein's mother in Torch Song Trilogy, which I saw uh, probably a year and a half before, uh, you know, we were on Golden Girls, yeah. and she just took Broadway by storm. The combination of little Estelle Getty, and she was teeny tiny with Big Harvey, was just so hysterical. And the two of them, such good actors. So did she start? Did she start acting late in life? No, she was doing it from very early on, but she never got success. Never got it. So I've right. been wanting to do actually a, write a one woman show about her, and I started talking to her family and different people that worked with her. So she would cook dinner for her family and then go off and do some crazy off-Broadway show in, you know, down in the bowels of Manhattan. And her son told the story. They would go see her in a play, and there would be their mother, like, in her bra and panties. And they're like, oh, my God, Mom, get dressed. Um, obviously, she was wearing more clothes for Torch Song Trilogy. Right. Um, but she became kind of the mother for gay people. And, you know, during that time... Uh, you know, it was the beginning of the AIDS epidemic, and a lot of the cast started getting sick. Right. And I heard amazing stories that she would go to the hospitals, and she thought at the time, because we didn't know that much about it, that she would just bring chicken soup and feed them and think that that would get <laughs> people better, and she didn't really know. And then when she right. moved to Hollywood, she was one of the few actors of note that would go to benefits for to raise money for, and awareness for AIDS. 
because uh, back then, you know, it started with just pretty much female actors. But if you were in the closet as a gay male actor, you would never go into a benefit. And then, you know, Elizabeth Taylor got involved and I went to a big benefit and there was you know, Bette Midler and, you know, tons of people started coming out and raising more money. Is it still hard to be gay? It's not hard to be gay in Hollywood now, right? It still is. I mean, people think it isn't, but, you know, even after we wrote the lesbian kiss, kiss episode of Roseanne, that opened a lot of doors, I think, for Alan and for Well and Grace to come about. But then we've had very difficult times. We wrote a um, lesbian pilot about a lesbian and her estranged father, and they both chased women and they both fucked around on their partners. So they kind of were cut from the same cloth. Mm -hmm. It was called Skirt Chasers, and the networks loved the script, loved the writing. We've never seen this story, which was a pretty unique take on it. But they would say, well, we've done our one gay show this year. We can't do another one. <laughs> we could have 5,000 murder shows and right. CSIs, but only one gay lesbian show. So what we did was we turned it into a web series, and we cut it into six parts. And we got a company called Tello Films, and... Um, for $20,000, we made that show. We had Barry Bostrick from Rocky Horror Picture Show, Elizabeth Keener from The L Word, Meredith Baxter from Family Ties. We got um, Leah Delaria to record. Um, she did a brilliant cover of I'm a Girl Watcher, that old 50s song. And uh, we made a great show. And it was very exciting. So I'm not one to, when I hit a no or a wall to figure a way around it. Um, mm -hmm. We wrote another show, a gay show called Silver Foxes, which takes place in Palm Springs. And it was, you know, labeled kind of a gay men's golden girls and logo started it. They asked us to write a, uh, they wanted like a gay men's golden girls. And we came up with the show about three older gay men that live in Palm Springs. Um, much like your house. And, Mid-century. Hello. Are you trying um, to get this the house or the old guy in it? <laughs> all of the above. And uh, then their friend Jerry is coming for a visit. Um, he doesn't show up, but his boyfriend is waiting for him. He uh, just noticed the twink. So none of them know his name because Jerry... Just the twink. Just the twink. So Jerry... Uh, if, why should we learn his name? Jerry changes boyfriends like he does Lexuses every five years. So we... Put, we wrote the script for a TV pilot, and we put together a big reading in my living room, and I cold called George Takei and Leslie Jordan, the late Leslie Jordan. I didn't know either of them. And they both said, what time will be there? Wow. And uh, then I got Bruce Valance, Todd Sherry, Sherry O'Terry from SNL, Melissa Peterman from Reba, Daniel Gaither, and we did an amazing reading in my living room, brought the network, and they couldn't believe we assembled this cast and I had a producer there, how we could film it cheaply. And they like, we don't have enough money to make the show. Was okay. that logo you said? Logo. Yeah. Okay. I was like, oh, okay. So then we wanted to get it out to other networks. No network would read the script. They said the characters are too old and they're gay. No one will watch it. We were screaming golden girls. Didn't matter. Uh, and that became a story. Uh, I was doing publicity for a web series, and uh, I started talking about it. And that became this worldwide story of how there's still so much homophobia in the entertainment business. So, again, not leaving, uh, you know, taking no for an answer, we turned Silver Foxes into a live theater play. And it was just published. You can get it through TRW Plays or the Drama Bookshop. And we had the world premiere of it last year in Dallas. It sold out before we opened. And it was directed by the wonderful Michael Yuri, who people will know from Ugly Betty and Shrinking. Mm -hmm. And uh, and going back to Torsong Trilogy, he actually played the Harvey Firestein part in a big Broadway revival um, a couple of years ago. And it's going to have its Midwest premiere in September in um, near Columbus, Ohio, with a gay theater company called evolution and maybe one day we'll do it down here in palm springs we should i think it would be a huge hit it would run forever yeah. like the fantastics uh, it's um it's very funny like a golden girls episode but it's, it's also very uh, it touches your heart there's real stories about us as older gay men and 
how we are still here and surviving and how we find our chosen families okay. and how we want to live as we get older. In Dallas, it was staged in Theater in the Round. And Michael had this really cool idea of creating a front door and the audience had to walk through the front door to get to their seats. And then the stage in the center was the was their house. So each night, my writing partner, Gemini, would sit on different seats to see you know the different angles. It was so cool to watch people across from us. And I saw so many gay and lesbian couples at certain parts hold each other's hands or they would be crying or be laughing or pointing. It was right. so emotional for them. And after they would find us and they said, thank you for right. never see ourselves represented in popular entertainment. And you were giving us voice. And that was very powerful. And that's why I'm working so hard to keep that show alive and get it out into the world. And hopefully it could be a TV series. Okay, we're going to get to your history here. Okay. <laughs> All right. So you're gay and you're Jewish. What else? I'm gay and Jewish. What else? Terribly sexy, great dancer. Um, I did study with Joffrey Ballet in college, and I luckily got to do a month run. Uh, Joffrey Ballet did a show on Broadway with Rudolf Nureyev, and they asked me to be a part of that. And it was mostly just kind of moving behind him. It wasn't you know, a lot of dancing. But I got to say I was on Broadway. Wow. And I somehow uh, positioned myself... So that at the curtain call, I was standing behind the Rudolf Nureyev. So when the audience would scream bravo and stand on their feet, I took it in as if it was me. Right. Um, but it was thrilling to, uh, go, you know, walk out of back, you know, a backstage door on Broadway every right. night. Um, that would be cool. It was very cool. We were given a note not to speak to Rudolf. And uh, so we could never go up to him. And a couple of times he would come walking up to us and be like, oh, my God, what did we say? But he wanted to. Just talk and be normal. And then uh, you want to get to the sex part, right? Well, I just want to know how your coming out story went. Uh, Let's hear well, I had, a tour, yeah, well, I had a tour de fair on the show. <laughs> a showman's with a young boy who was also studying at the Joffrey. But he was seriously a dancer. I went as part of NYU. Um, I was studying acting. And I... We also were taking dance classes, and the dance teacher said, you have such natural ability, but you need to learn the foundations of dance. And that's what made me take ballet, and I, I don't know, I don't want to do it. And then I just fell in love with it. But there was a boy there who uh, lived in the neighborhood. Uh, he was, at the time, 17. Uh, on his 18th birthday, though, we all took him out uh, for drinks, because then he could drink. And that night, just throw your glasses anyway. I rested my glasses on the floor. I'm so insulted by the story. Um, <laughs> Wait, how old were you? 19? Okay. Yeah, it was only two-year difference. But he was no year difference, I guess. But he was still, you know, he was still in high school, I guess. He was finishing up high school. <laughs> and what state are you in? In Manhattan. And his family well, lived. the drinking age is not 18 in Manhattan, is it? You said you Maybe it off. was back then. Really? Was it? Huh. Yes, it was, actually. I'm back. Was fa I'm fact-checking. Yeah, you. it was back then. No, because I remember going to, at NYU, I started when I was 17, because I have a late birthday in October. And in my theater program, it was mostly transfer students, so they were all older than me. So they would want to go out to gay bars and drink or whatever, or any bar. And I couldn't go the first month, because uh, I was only 17. Well, so he turned 18, so that night... You know, we were a little tipsy. I walked him home when he said, do you want to come upstairs? And I, in his parents' apartment, really? like a brownstone, so it's a couple floors, we go to his room, he locks the door, and we start making out. And uh, you know, at that age, you're just very passionate. Yeah. And then all of a sudden, I hear banging on the door. It's his sister, his little sister. I know you have somebody in there. And I'm like, oh, fuck, no, what did you do? <laughs> um... So he got rid of her, and then uh, we did. So he, he, like, killed her? He killed her? <laughs> Why did he go to that? Well, you said he got rid of her. He got, I mean. I rid of her, sounds like a pain in the ass. Well, <laughs> she was interrupting our very exciting moment. Uh, but we, you know, it was more than just sex. We actually, like, we had, like, a romance. And then he starts dating our female ballet teacher. And I'm like, wait a minute. I, I went home that summer, and I'm like, we're writing letters and talking on the phone. And then he tells me 
you know, and he loves me, but he also loves this woman. And this woman was living with an actor at a broad off Broadway theater where I ran the box office. It was all so incestuous. <laughs> I'm like, I can't handle any more of this. But I still do have all my love letters. And maybe I'll do a play out here one time. Stan's love letters. But that was your coming out story? Um, no, that was, no, uh, I guess. Well, I'd gone, oh my God, the year of my high school prom, I was underage in Detroit. And my friend took me to a gay bar. We sat in the uh, uh, parking lot and it was like my stomach. I had such a stomach. Ache. I can't go in there. So the week of the prom, I also went to my first gay bar. And of course, you know, we walked in and I probably looked like I was 14 or 15. And we got a lot of Drake's bar for us. And uh, so that was my introduction to like the gay scene. But then in New York, uh, one of the first dorm parties we had, and I met this uh, a friend, of, a roommate of a friend from uh, my drama program gorgeous tall blonde nazi looking guy just not stunning and he wanted to have sex with me and i remember i we walked through washington square park and we sat on a bench and i made him say he loved me before i would go any further i was that s silly like i thought you had to love somebody to have sex with them so he said it and that night things happened and then the next morning like he did talk to me he wouldn't call me back and I remember my friend said, Stan, this is the gay world. And it was a real, it was like, it was an eye opener that um, you can have sex and enjoy yourself and not be connected to love. And I just hadn't grown up with that. I, you know, I grew up watching Love American Style and, you know, rom-coms. And, and even though my parents were divorced, still thinking there was happily ever after. So when did, how old were you when they got divorced? Late, like 16. And then did you come out to your parents? Not till much later. Um, through college. No, actually, um, it was actually after college and I moved to L.A. And I remember having a conversation on the phone with my mother who was back in Detroit. And I said, um, uh, I just have to tell you, you know, that I'm gay. I just had to, because we were best friends. And she said, well, I didn't know if you were and I didn't know if you weren't. And that was kind of it. And That's then it. that was it. And she was fine. Uh, I think she kind of liked having a gay son. Because in the last year when she was getting divorced, when we were, you know, in the house, uh, my senior year, she introduced me to weird little indie movies. And we would go to movies together. And she introduced me to some great films that I never would have seen. You know, they weren't blockbusters. They were just quirky little things. Right. Um, and we... Just loved hanging out together. And, uh, you know, she probably couldn't have done that if I was some straight dude, you know, wanting to right. play basketball. But, um, and then my father, so they were divorced. And then I it was just, that was, that was a, a tear jerking scene. I was at his office when I was home in Michigan one time. And uh, I, somehow I ended up sitting at his desk and he was went to the bathroom. And he came back in and I go, here's the moment. I just have to say it. And I said it, and he just started crying, and he says, I just want my son back. And he came over, he hugged me, and we cried, and that was that. What did he mean by that? I think he meant, you know, it's interesting, we talk about it in the new century, where right. so many of us hide. Right. That there was a part of me that's hidden. You know, I mean, two of the moms in the play talk about that. Uh, I just want to be in your life and be me and be genuine, and... You know, when you're in the closet with your parents, you can't be. So there was, you know, it was questions, are you dating a girl or what are you doing? Or um, I could say, you know, yeah, you know, some guy I'm dating took me to Studio 54. Like what? Like they wouldn't have understood any of that. Um, that's a whole other. So did uh, he mean now we can be real? Now I, you can be you. Okay. All right. That's what I took it out. Okay. And it wasn't this person that I had to, you know, be in whatever I thought he wanted. But then other shit got in the way, and, and um, we ended up in his later years not talking. And uh, yeah, so that, that but he, he's passed start. on, though. He has passed on, and my mother passed uh, two years ago, and that was mm -hmm. really difficult. Right. And actually, it connects to Palm Springs. I was uh, set to come down and do um, 
a show about Golden Girls uh, without Alexander Rodriguez at Oscars. And um, that uh, Wednesday, I think, and that Sunday, my mom had a stroke and went into the hospital. And in L.A., and um, they said, you know, sh there's nothing you can do. You have to go. go. She, you know, the next two days, we're going to be able to see, like, is she going to rally or is it be time to let her go? And I thought, we sold out here at Oscars. I, how can I, like, I guess I could cancel. But I remember on Golden Girls, actually, the first episode that they filmed that we wrote, the week of shooting, B. Arthur's mother died. Mm -hmm. And the producers offered to cancel the taping. And she said, no, like, all these thousands of people that work on the show, their livelihood is connected to the show, you know. And she came from the theater where the show must go on is, is a, right. a motto. And she sucked it up and did the show. But it's, it's really hard to watch that episode because the whole episode is about mothers and daughters. And there's a beautiful scene I mean, it just was just by chance. It was, the, right, it was that right. episode where she's at the... Um, so the story is about uh, Betty White's mother comes to visit and she treats her like an old, like a little child. Right. And uh, so there's a beautiful scene at the kitchen table with Estelle Getty and, um, and B. Arthur. And Estelle says, you know, thank you. you. You treat me like a person. And it so touches B. She can't even look Estelle in the eye. She's got to turn away. And every time I see that scene, the hairs on my arms stand up because I know what's going on, what's going on behind yeah. it. So I said to Alexander, no, let's go down. I can't really do anything. And uh, so I came down to Foam Springs and uh, I didn't even tell him what was going on. I didn't tell him until later because I didn't want that to what? cloud. Cloudy, yeah. yeah, where yeah. he was at. But that I wanted to... You know, people are coming to this joyous event, so I kept it all to myself. Right. And just stand, just keep it together, keep it together, do the show. We did the show, and I'm like, and I'm looking at the mountains, and I'm just like, be peaceful, like, fine, you know. But I didn't know what I was going to get on the way back. And I went right back to the hospital in Burbank, and unfortunately, you know, she did not rally. And she was such a strong woman. And my grandmother lived to be 101. So we always joked, she are going to be 101 or like older. So I was a little surprised that she wasn't starting to eat or anything. And that was when we had to, you know, go into hospice. And, well, and so the whole thing was 13 days of just utter hell. And I talked about that a lot in my book, what that was like. And um, letting, letting her go. And since then, I've learned so much more about death I didn't really know. I mean, I had people pass, but that we celebrate life, but we don't really celebrate death. And what are the stages of death? Like, I just wanted her to eat or drink, drink something. And now I'm learning, no, like it, she was on a natural progression not to, her body was shutting down. She had dementia before that. So already part of you is, is leaving your body. Right. And that's why when you see someone with dementia or Alzheimer's, they look like themselves, but it's not quite themselves because already they're passing on. Right. Their body is like, their souls almost left their body and like it's hovering somewhere above. And there's very odd. And I, I mean, I saw her a lot because she ended up moving from Santa Barbara down to my, near my house. So I would see her all the time. But I kind of talk about it as like, as like a, a dimmer, like just going down, 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 right. down. So as much as I didn't want her to go, she always said she did not want to suffer. She was always just, just push me over a cliff. And I'm like, Mom, I'd love to, but I can't. Right. You know, I, I would get arrested. And uh, I know she would never want to be in any compromising position. She had all the directives. She did not want tubes. So in a way, I'm glad it happened when it did because I would never want to see it like you know, she, she still remembered who I was when I would go to visit her weekly and, right. you know, she, the way she would light up and we could have great talks. But uh, I, I was always afraid of where are we headed with this? And um, I guess in a good way, if there's any silver lining, it's that mm. she didn't have to experience that. And I guess in some way, neither did I. Mm. You didn't think you'd get into that, huh? Oh, oh, let's get go. back to sex. <laughs> no, that's okay. You mentioned your book. So what's your book? It's called The Girls from Golden to Gilmore, and it's stories about all the wonderful women I worked with and Roseanne. And um, luckily, I kept journals since college. And wow. um, 
I wrote a lot in my journals during all the different shows that I've been on. So when I first got a publisher, I started going back to the journals and pulling all the sections about these women. And that's how I started it. And that kind of gives it a framework and, and seeing, um, you know, the passion and the intensity when you're a young person and then, you know, looking at it as a slightly more mature right. fella. Yeah. So how many years of um, journals do you have? Since college, thousands of them. Thousands. I, I wrote actually before I came here. <laughs> um, you know, there's times when you write more and sometimes right. you write less. And um, I always write a year-end kind of wrap-up before I, and I sit down. I have that time. On New Year's Eve and, um, you know, I pick, you know, my five favorite, my fa favorite and best and worst <laughs> movies and theater that I've seen. So just kind of chronicle my year. And I remember two years ago, I was sat down, ready to go. And all of a sudden my phone's like, blah, 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 blah. I'm like, oh God, okay. I look at it. It's like Betty White just died. Oh, wow. And it was like, okay, I think my day's going to change. And it right. did. Right. Um, you know, she was close to turning a hundred and everybody was very excited about that. And then um, some media asked me if I would go live to talk about her and I said yes and um, I guess my take was a little different because people were so sad and my thought was no she picked this day because we were celebrating with drinks <laughs> or <laughs> martinis or champagne because right. she was just about making people laugh right and so I said let's take this moment and just you know knock one back for Betty and toast to her and her long life and yes we would love her to go on forever but she right. gave us so many years of so much entertainment um, to celebrate that and, and look at, at, at uh, the, the wonderfulness of her. So I always ask my guest, what have you learned in your life? What are a couple lessons? Oh, my God. They carry with you. Thousands. Well, you're going to have to get the book to see them. All right. Um, pick, pick a couple. Pick a couple. I mean, the obvious are um, uh, pick your battles. A big one is trust the rhythm of life. Don't fight it. I've become a very visual person, as you know, from sitting next to me at the director's table. Have, uh, I picture like being on a roller coaster, you know, and sometimes you're screaming and it's scary and then sometimes it's, but you can't get out of that little car. Right. So ride it and enjoy the ride. You know, I'm like, no, I can't do it. And people always want to sit next to me on roller coasters because I guess I scream in a funny way and make funny noises or say things. Wow. Um, and then after it's like, oh, let's ride it again. So that's like life. You know, right. there's going to be right. going up and going, oh, what's going to happen? And then, ah. Um, so I learned that of not fighting where you are. Uh, the other big one is living in the present. That I think you get into trouble if you live in the past or the future. But if you live in the actual moment, it's just right. a beautiful moment. And take it in because especially the older you get, time goes fast. It sure do. Sure do. <laughs> like this wonderful interview. How about that? How about that? Well, thank you for coming in. I know you're really, really busy. So busy, but never busy enough to spend time with you. Thank you. Um, what we're going to do is you're going to give me some info, and we'll put everything we've talked about plus other things uh, in your My OnlyFans page. In, yeah, in your notes. Yeah, and we'll you. leave the OnlyFans off. Okay. All right, fine. Okay. The OnlyStands page. Yeah. Thanks for coming in.